In this episode of Voice of the Sea, we're investigating the effects of beach cleaning machines in Hawaii. We talk to regional and national marine debris experts about the sources and solutions to marine debris. Take a ride on a beach cleaning machine and learn about research to study the effects of cleaning beaches with machines. In a few minutes, our beach cleaning crew is gonna come out here and they have this big machine called the Charrington. And it's basically a large sand sifter. So it goes through the beach, picks up debris and sand, sifts the sand out and then keeps the debris and stashes it away for us to throw away. The Charringtons are probably the biggest, most you know, useful heavy machines that we have when it comes to cleaning our beaches. Uh, they are limited by the access that we have to certain beaches, so we can't do it at all of our beach parks. We'd love to, but um, it's a machine that has to be transported here, and then it also has to be put onto the beach. And it also needs a certain width. Um, it's even uh, the softness of sand can impact uh, the machines as well. Kailua Beach Park, uh, some of the other rural parks, like on the west side, Tracks, uh, Kalana Ane Ole Beach Park, uh, Hale Eva Ali'i and Waimanalo and Kalama right up the beach as well too are some of the ones that we hit on a monthly basis but more frequently on a weekly basis we get parks like Ala Moana Regional Park, um, Aina Moana which is Magic Island, the Waikiki beaches so Kohio Surf Beach, Queens Beach, Kaimana and then Hanama Bay Nature Preserve. This is really one of the best ways of getting debris, and it's unfortunately only able to get the large debris. So, you know, if you go to a lot of beaches, we see what are called the microplastics, and because it has to sift the sand through, it's about an inch or so, the, the pukas in between, so it doesn't pick up the microplastics. That's the other thing I want to mention, is that these machines are, are really effective on the larger, wider beaches that we can access. We have a really robust volunteer community out here, a wide variety of nonprofits that really help us in beach cleaning efforts as well, too, and some of the the more rugged beach areas. We have staff that can do cleaning as well too, but really the armies of volunteers that we have here, whether that's 808 cleanups, uh, surf rider, sustainable coastlines, parlay, all of them pay an integral role in keeping our beaches clean. So for people who are wondering about large marine animals such as monk seals or turtles that might be using the beach to rest, are they in danger of the beach cleaner? If there's a monk seal, um, the Hawaii Marine Animal Response Program uh, does a really good job of cordoning off those areas and alerting us as well. Um, so absolutely, if there's uh, marine mammals that are there, we're cognizant of that and we, tr we work around them and we'll reschedule the cleaning. For people who might be concerned about ghost crabs or things like that, are they mostly able to get out of the way of the cleaner? Yeah, so, and, and also we're not going too deep with the beach cleaners, so they, they have a, a potential of going about six inches, but we stay to the top three inches in case there's anything burrowing. But ghost crabs, they'll run away. They're not stupid creatures. They'll, <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll know to vacate and they'll come back afterwards. <laughs> right here, this, this is how I always operate, yeah? So this is, the bucket in the back of the, the bin. Okay. So this one right here is for go up. So the bin, if you look over here, the bin go up. Yeah. So if you hold them, the bin go up. And then this one go down. Yeah. So there's all numbers. Yeah. And then this one is to open the bin on the bottom. So it opens a lot of all the rubbish. This one is to close it. So if you push them, it's gonna close. And then on this side, it has the rake the grooming and then over here it changes i get all my gauges and then this one this is how deep i go inside the sand so this is what i go right now they're all the rubbish right there look yeah. over here on the screen You gotta go slow, especially over here. The sand is so fine, and underneath is wet that it, it picks it up real fast. You see, the sand is collecting, so it comes like that. I gotta stop. I'd wait for an inch to come out. Yes, sift it out, and then I can go. When the sand is wet, that's what I gotta deal with. But if you look back here, look how clean. Yes, exactly, but I'm mowing the beach. <laughs> I usually make one big loop like that come around. So that's what I'm gonna do right now. I'm gonna 
loop around and I'll come on the top, come down. That way I come back like this, make like a circle, just so I clean everything. Next, we head to Kauai to talk with University of Hawaii Sea Grant Coastal Land Use Specialist, Ruby Pap. There is a pretty active community, very concerned, as you know, about um, plastics on our beaches. Surf rider, et cetera, do a lot of beach cleanups where they pick up this stuff by hand and they do an excellent job. There was also a desire from some community members to look at how can we get this done faster, quicker, more efficiently, and to look at actual beach cleaners and they were advocating for the county to buy one and clean up their beaches, the beach parks, with these cleaners. But the county wanted to make sure that they weren't going to be adding any additional impacts onto the beach by trying to do something good, but then inadvertently killing some of the beach critters or messing up the ecosystem. And I said, oh, this is a great opportunity to do a study because there aren't a lot of studies in Hawaii on the basic structure of our sandy intertidal beaches and what lives in our beaches. And it's something that I've really been interested in for a long time, being a coastal management person myself. We went to Kailua, where we know that they're cleaning monthly. But there's a section that they don't clean, so we just we have a clean beach and an unclean beach. We conducted a little study to examine the impacts of mechanical beach cleaning to see if there are any impacts from those cleaners. We decided to count, um, use ghost crabs as an indicator for beach health. And then we did some environmental DNA, but in the water itself, because that was a more proven technique to gather environmental DNA data. And we're waiting for the environmental DNA from Dr. Rob Tunin's group, which I know you're gonna be talking to him as well. University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. You're watching Voice of the Sea. We're at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology talking with Dr. Rob Tonin about the work his lab is doing to identify the unseen organisms living in beach sand. We want to clean up beaches because there's a lot of trash on there, there's plastic, there's things that wash up from all over the world. Everything that goes overboard on a ship ends up on a beach somewhere. And so it's important to clean that up, but there's also a bunch of organisms that live on beaches and crabs and shrimp and worms and snails, that that is their home. Really the question is, what are we doing when we are cleaning up the beaches, when we are harvesting all of this trash that comes up, are we actually having an effect on that sea life that is also trying to live in that area? And if so, is it an effect that we can do something about? Can you describe for me the types of organisms that might be living in the sand here in Hawaii? So if we start with the really small organisms, there's a whole suite of microbes. So oh, bacteria, sure. archaea, all of these groups that are specialized to that environment. They live coating those sand grains. And if we go up one size from that, there's the organisms that feed on those. And so we have things like ciliates and amoeba and all of these other organisms that are actually living on the surface of sand grains. And then there's a whole range of organisms that actually live their entire lives between sand grains. And they're called the interstitial community. And those organisms, there's there are ciliates, there are protozoans, there's a whole bunch of, of sort of larger organisms, but still small enough that we wouldn't see them when we go to the beach. There's a whole group of these small organisms like amphipods and copepods that are, a lot of people refer to them as the cockroaches of the sea. They're the little bugs, creepy crawlies on the beach that you see sort of, of crawling around. And as we move up from there, the polychaete worms are the same as earthworms, but they're the marine equivalent and they live on the beaches. And then we get up into the snails and there are some snails that are so tiny, the micro gastropods, they're the same size as the sand grains, all the way up to 
like a moon snail, which can be a very large organism that is cruising around and you know, basically burrowing its way through the sand and feeding as it goes. And then there are shrimps and crabs that are specialized. And those organisms are then feeding on the rest of the food chain underneath them. Why, in a biological sense, is it important to maintain that community in the sand? I talked about it as the different levels, and that's because that's food. The fishes, the nearshore organisms, birds that are coming to feed on the crabs on the beach, those ghost crabs don't have any food if there's none of the underlying stuff under there, unless they're picking up our leftover hot dogs sitting on the beach from trash. You know, that's what there's left in terms of the food chain. And so all of those organisms are feeding something higher up in the food chain. And as we move up that food chain, that supports our nearshore fisheries and, and our seabirds that are feeding on the ghost crabs. So when you were uh, approached about this study and trying to understand how mechanized beach cleaning might impact the organism community living in the sand, um, how did you approach the problem? So the first question that we were just basically asking is what's there? Since we don't know what most of those organisms are, then we thought the, the easiest approach is actually going to be to use DNA and try to figure out based on the, the genetic signature of what's in the sand. So we've just started working on the DNA part. Next, we head to the lab with Catherine Veal to see how environmental DNA is processed. You're gonna kind of walk me through a little bit how we're gonna get this environmental DNA out of the filters that we've had swimming around in the water at the beach trying to figure out what organisms are living in the sand. Yeah, for sure. So it's like you have these filters and they're floating around in the water. When they come to us, they come in those little wire cages and then we can take them out of the wire cages with like tweezers and then we will fold it up and place it into a small tube filled with ATL buffer and proteinase K. It is a, um, it's a tissue lysis buffer, so it actually lyses any whole cells that you have, and it'll release the DNA from the nuclear membrane into the solution. So these ones have been incubating in the tissue lysis buffer, so all of the cells have burst, and now they are ready to be extracted. And so what you do is you would take the, the liquid out of here that has all the DNA in it now, so the filter doesn't have the DNA in, on it anymore, it's now into the solution, and you'd pass it through a spin column, which is this little, little membrane inside of this part of the tube. Mm -hmm. And you put it in a centrifuge, and that will collect all the DNA onto a new filter. And then what do you do with that tiny filter now? So with the tiny filter, you would put it through a set of washes that would take out all of the stuff that's not DNA, say like lipid membranes or other nuclear garbage that just isn't, it isn't useful for our purposes. So it kind of washes it out and then you're left with just DNA, which you then would elute with an elution buffer. When we have our elution, that is basically a vial of just all of the DNA that is in the system. It's just, it's incredible what we can do with environmental DNA. The amount of information we get, the gigabytes of data, you know, it's, it's daunting, but you get to see such a big picture of a system. And does all environmental DNA come from water or are there other ways, can you collect it from the air? You can, yes. There's people who have collected it from the air. Uh, they have like filters that like pull air through like a vacuum through a filter. Um, there's people who collect uh, environmental DNA from flowers. They'll like swab the flower to see what insects are using the flower, like what pollinators are visiting certain flowers. There's people who have done studies on like snow, so they'll like swipe or they'll take a sample of snow from like a like bear track or something, and they can identify, oh, what species of bear was that? Broadly speaking, I think that we need to do more research on environmental DNA and keep pushing the field forward because I feel like the power of this stuff is incredible, and like the things we can do with this that could save time and money is awesome. What information is that going to tell us about the beaches that have been cleaned and the beaches that have not been cleaned? Well, I think primarily it'll tell us presence absence data. So for example, if the beach that has been cleaned does not have a certain species on it because of the cleaning, we will be able to kind of compare the two sample sites and kind of say, okay, we found this crab at the uncleaned beach, but we didn't find it at the clean beach. So what's, what gives, <laughs> you know? <laughs> at this point in your study, do you have data about the comparisons? Uh, at this point, we do not, unfortunately, but we are going to get sequence data going. So I'm really excited to see what's in these samples.
Next, Dr. Van Wishingrad explains how environmental DNA is analyzed and used to identify organisms. One of the key things about environmental DNA is we try to find regions of the genome that we have a lot of data about so that we can compare them and know what the taxa are, the species are. This region here specifically is cytochrome oxidase 1, which is a gene region that uh, is maybe the most abundant gene region for data across the tree of life. What we do is we can then take these gene sequences, match them to a database, and get a species list for an area. And we can understand what domain they're in, the phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species of each of those sequences. Sometimes we don't get to species, we might get to genus or family or even order or kingdom, but uh, we get to the level that's as detailed as we feel we have the confidence to claim. You have all the data organized right now. What does it look like when it comes to you and how do you get it into this really organized thing where I can take a look and see, oh, you have these species or, or oh, they match up in that way? The sequence data we get back is, it's a big text file and it's a, uh, a database position and then uh, number of reads in each sample. So number of matches to that region. These text files can be really big, like gigabytes in size. And so we use supercomputers to process, to work through them, to generate these database files. Are there things that you look for to assure yourself that the information you got, that that text file is accurate? One of the things we do is we include a blank sample. And so that blank is going to be one that we bring into the field, but we don't actually put anything into it. Even these blanks sometimes have things in them, have species that we find in them. And what we do is we subtract from our samples whatever we find in the blank. We also look in the lab, as we are extracting the DNA, we have another blank. And that might also have some species in it that aren't in our samples, but are in our blank. So we can uh, safely remove them from our samples. So that would be like an environmental contaminant or some piece of DNA that came off of me while I was processing the sample. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so a lot of times you find human in those samples. Um, sometimes dogs or cats, um, like pets, things like that. We like take every precaution to make sure our laboratory is really clean and we are doing things at the highest standards for eDNA work. But eDNA is really sensitive and that's uh, one of the, the strengths of the technique, but it's also some, one of the limitations because it is liable to contamination. And at the end of the day, you're going to be able to tell me approximately how many different types of organisms within each group like limu are, are found in the sand there. Yeah, we should be able to compare groups in the clean sand and the unclean sand and see at a very um, basic level, how do those communities differ? We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators, a passion to change lives spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds. Help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. You're watching Voice of the Sea. We're talking with marine debris expert, Dr. Mary Donahue to learn more about individual, community, national, and global solutions to marine debris. Can you tell me a little bit about your expertise in marine debris? My background in marine debris started over 20 years ago. I worked for NOAA here in Hawaii at the Honolulu Lab, and I served as the first marine debris coordinator for NOAA in Hawaii. I started, along with my colleagues, the first ever derelict fishing gear and marine debris removal in what was then called the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So I served as chief scientist on multiple expeditions to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, where we dove for 30 days at a time and removed marine debris from the coral reefs. 
And more recently, I've been working in the national realm and contributing to solutions on the national and global scale. And one of those is a recent report I co-authored. It was a National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine study that was a two-year study. And we produced a report that explores and discusses all aspects of the U.S. contributions to global ocean plastic. The report can be accessed for free on the National Academies of Sciences website. Anyone can download it. There have been some studies on the mainland looking at how the beach cleaners, the big scrapers, affect the little animals that live in the sand, the infaunal creatures. And there's some evidence to suggest that it could disrupt those little guys' communities, but also it could alter the chemical cycling within the sands that's so important for the oxygen dispersal and other things. So we needed to look specifically at Hawaii so we could be sure that the cleaning that's done could be done as well as possible to minimize the environmental effects. One of the things that I worry about is when I take my daughter to the beach and she's playing in the sand and picking up these pieces of plastic with her hands, are there chemicals that are coming off that plastic that could be harmful? That's something that we're learning more and more about. And it's you may see in some of the beach cleanups now that we're wearing plastic gloves because of what you're talking about. Plastics also leach the chemicals that they were made from into the environment or into the bodies of animals, including humans. In addition to those chemicals, there are toxic additives in plastics that can also leach out into the environment. In addition, as you said, to the chemicals coming out of the plastic, a wide variety of, of toxins can stick to the plastic and including viruses and bacteria that can cause disease in animals and humans. I think what we have to do is look for every possible opportunity to clean plastics from our environment. It's gonna improve our health, our children's health. It's gonna save animals. It's gonna make our beaches so much more fun to be on and in, in the water. And one of those is probably beach cleaning mechanized. And I think when we find out more about our data from the environmental or eDNA, we'll better understand how to work with our beach cleaners to reduce those impacts. What are the hopes that you have or bright spots that you can see for our future? I think there are bright spots. Right now, there is so much interest in this problem and there are is action at all levels of community, all the way up to uh, the United Nations. So there's a lot of reason to have hope. People have decided that we have to do something. And so I'm really happy that that's happened. And I think we're gonna see some big changes. Marine debris and ocean plastic waste is a global problem. We can help by reducing our use of plastic by recycling and by disposing of waste responsibly. We can also get involved by joining local cleanups and by supporting innovations that reduce plastic use. Together, we can make a difference. Visit voiceofthesea.org to learn more and to find regional marine debris cleanups. Follow us on social media at Voice of the Sea TV. Mahalo for watching Voice of the Sea. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org.